So that thumbnail was not bait click. I've heard people say and continue to say that Arnold was the greatest of all time. I need to correct you. Aya Stark is the goat. She makes the predator look like the Smith machine. Break the cycle, Morty. Rise above. Focus on science. Now that an important piece of information has been cleared up, I'm making this follow-up video to my first video on training to failure. Now in my first video, I explained how this question is nuanced. Should you train to failure? Depends on many variables, which is multifactorial in nature, my favorite word. And I presented a model by Tip, effectively where he bases training to failure on the neurological demand on your body. He has seven levels which represent how neurologically demanding exercises can be. Level one being the hardest, the most stressful on the body, the nervous system. Level seven being, being the lighter. And so level one is complex gymnastic and Olympic lifts, for example, a snatch or a front lever. And these exercises, according to Tibbs, should never be taken to failure. Level six and seven, the, the lesser neurologically stressor activities. Tib recommends failure for all sets. And he also says that these are exercises which are normally trained to higher rep ranges, more volume. Very simply put, the larger neurologically demanding exercises, which are really the major compounds, your bench press, deadlift, etc., he does not recommend going to failure. Whereas if you like the more isolated work, for example, a bicep curl, are more applicable to training to failure according to Tibbs' model. And so the takeaway with this question is it's highly nuanced and variable. There is no set in stone answer. If you're training to failure, you're not wrong. If you're not training to failure, you're not wrong. It heavily depends on your circumstances. Last two or three or four repetitions, that's what makes actually the muscle then grow. And that uh, divides then one from a champion and one from not being a champion. If you can go through this pain barrier, you make it to be a champion. If you can't go through, forget it. And that's what most people lack is on this having the guts. However, there's a new piece of research from Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, and I want to communicate that to you. Again, not as a set in stone definitive document you must abide by. The point of this video is to help people understand the process that goes into disseminating academic information about training. It is a further contribution to your knowledge base, which you can take, analyze, and apply to you if you feel appropriate. And the idea of training to failure is still and rightfully a debated concept. And there are people with different philosophies who have many valid ideas, and we must incorporate and debate and continue to improve our understanding of this idea. However, the first thing we can think about is the actual definition of failure. That is actually highly debated in itself. Training to failure is defined as the point where the activated muscles are incapable of completing another complete repetition without assistance. And so Dr. Schoenfeld has released a new paper into this concept of failure, which looks at evidence based information in regards to this idea. And to break this down simply for you, here are the takeaways from his paper. When training to muscle failure, consider these things. Number one, load may be more relevant with lower loads because larger motor units may not be activated until failure is reached. With higher loads, higher threshold motor units are recruited almost immediately. So this again relates to the type one and type two muscle fibers. I have several videos on muscle fiber types and how they relate to load and intensity, etc. So please have a look at some of my other content to understand the basis of muscle fibers and activation. But then we have the type two X fibers and these are the ultra fast fibers, the most explosive fibers responsible for those powerful movements. And these are glycolytic in nature and so they will, they will work and be powerful for a very short period of time, but they get tired very easily. And so we have a continuum of muscle fibers, and it's very important to think of muscle fibers as a continuum from type one, the more endurance based fibers, all the way through the type 2A to the type 2X. However, in essence, what he's saying here is that with a lower load, there is a lesser potential to activate the hard to reach type two muscle fibers, the more power based, faster to fatigue fibers, and therefore this greater amount of work, if you're using lower loads, may be applicable for you. Number two, safety. May be preferable for single joint and or machine based exercises. Training to failure with multi joint and or complex free weight exercises 
may increase the risk of injury. Safety is vitally important to me, my training philosophy. I've recently made a video about safety in relation to uh, Ashley on Instagram. And the theme of safety is so vital and risk reward is so important. When we look at my previous video and, and Tib's information on training to failure, another idea that you can connect to his exercises that he does not recommend for failure is safety, the larger compound lifts. And so that's another consideration for you to factor in. Number three, recovery. Failure may not be optimal if the training program includes a high weekly training frequency because training to muscle failure slows down post-exercise recovery to, for 24 to 48 hours. 2017 study that took 10 trained young male subjects, uh, which was nice because on average they actually had eight years of training experience and the bench press was impaired for 48 hours following the training session. Also creatine kinase only took 24 hours to return to baseline in the non-failure groups whereas it took 48 hours to return to baseline in the failure group. Uh, but basically everything is pointing towards the idea that training to failure takes a lot more of a toll on the body and as such takes a lot longer to, or at least a nice bit longer to recover from than not training to failure. And so here are the intricate variables that I discuss so often. If you have a higher frequency of training, i.e. you're hitting muscle groups more within one week, for example, then the need for training to failure decreases because when you're training to failure, your muscles may need that greater recovery time. And that would relate to your training split. If you're using some, if you're using a bro split, then you're not using a higher frequency model. And therefore you may be using the idea of training to failure more within your weekly sessions. However, if you're using, for example, a push-pull skip leg day, just joking, push-pull leg day split or some sort of upper body, lower body split, you know, there's, there are so many ways we can program, you, you will most likely have a higher frequency where you are hitting those sessions, for example, twice a week with a push-pull leg day split. And therefore, the need to train to failure may be decreased. And that will also relate to your exercise selection. Once you have got it established in your head that nothing is isolated, that everything is connected. With a push-pull leg split, you may not be using so many single joint exercises. You may, you may actually have some. Programming is unique to us, so you may have single joint exercises within push-pull legs. But, but for me, most likely they would be towards the end of the session, some sort of accessory work. And again, specificity comes into this idea. You have to consider your goals of training when you're thinking about ideas such as, should we use failure sets? And that may, that may sound very simple, you know, thinking about our goals, but it can be so overlooked when people just take all these different ideas of training and just throw them into their program and they don't stop and take a step back and think about their main goals of training and the factors within their training, such as their frequency and their splits and their periodization and their goals, and then consider whether that concept is useful for them. And so that's something I highly recommend you do. Look at your goals, your periodization, look at your exercise selection, frequency, your specificity, and then that will give you a greater knowledge base to think about this idea of training to failure. And lastly, age. Failure may not be warranted in older adults because older adults can have slower post-exercise recovery compared with younger individuals, and training to muscle failure slows recovery in itself. And so again, your unique characteristics, for example, age may influence whether you use failure sets and in this case, due to the idea of recovery. And recovery, of course, is a vital part of, of our training, as well as the actual act in itself. And in the piece, Eric highlights an earlier 2016 meta-analysis, which showed that there were no really significant differences between training to failure versus not training to failure in terms of strength and hypertrophy. So in terms of practical takeaways from this, it seems to be the case that if you can get very similar strength and size gains from training to failure and not training to failure, and not training to failure allows you to recover better, uh, perform potentially more volume, and at a higher frequency, you should use training to failure more sparingly. That isn't to say that you should never train to failure or it doesn't have a place in one's program. I think that a lot of people could benefit from training a little bit closer to failure. But with that said, I think that that mentality should be used intelligently and perhaps more sparingly for some. And in the piece, Eric gives the recommendation that you should save failure training for isolation exercises only, and you should save it for your last set of your last exercise for a given body part. And so I hope this very simple breakdown, in addition to my original video on, on training to failure, may help you in making this decision. And also, not just this decision with training to failure, it may help you with other decisions. For example, exercise selection and frequency. When we plan our training, 
ideas and concepts are overlapped and they're integrated in so many ways, in so many ways. And that's why these absolute statements in fitness can be so problematic. And so I genuinely hope this video may be useful to some of you. And I'm James Linker. This is the Shredded Spot Science. Thank you so much for 70,000 subscribers. I'm eternally grateful for the support I receive and people understanding the message I'm trying to push across in this channel. I'll see you soon.